It's good to see you. Last uh, Saturday morning, I woke up and I thought, this stupid cold is not going away. And I thought, well, maybe I should take one of those COVID tests. And then it turned out I had COVID. So I uh, called John and said, I think it'd probably be bad if I'm coughing on the communion bread. So <laughs> could you preach? And, and he did such an incredible job. So anyway, um, my suffering was intense. I died and went to heaven. And God said, you need to go back and preach the message that I... <laughs> Um, so let's pray. So God, uh, forgive me for lying to people, and um, thank you that you're here with us. And uh, Father, you know how insecure I am about, uh, well, about me and about this message. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help me preach what you want to say. Uh, I kind of wonder if I got COVID, so I would just like push through and say, well, I'm just going to say what I think God wants me to say. So, Lord, uh, thank you that, um, Jesus, thank you that in the revelation, I, I think you're that angel that mixes incense with the prayers of the saints, like correcting them. So, Father, whatever is uh, incorrect, I pray that you would correct. I pray that you, Lord Jesus, would be glorified in us, and I thank you that you say you will. So that prayer is going to be answered. Um, so right now, Jesus, we ask that you would open our hearts to what you have to say to us. Thank you that you're here with us and uh, that you love us way more than we love ourselves. It's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 26 years ago, uh, I was preaching from the book of First Peter, like we are today. My children were 9, 8, 6, and 3, and our church was growing by 50% a year. I remember standing up front, looking at the back door, and watching people turn away because there wasn't even any standing room in the sanctuary. We had a service on Saturday night, three on Sunday morning. Most of the material from those sermons at that time I haven't used this uh, time around, and yet some of the stories I have, because I think God was speaking to my heart through the stories, even if at the time I didn't have a paradigm to incorporate what he was uh, saying or fully embrace it. One night, I remember going to the gym, just kind of frustrated and praying, God, what are you, what are you saying to us from 1 Peter um, chapter 5? And suddenly I realized that it had everything to do with turtle pens. This is my son, John, around that time. Some of you know John because he was our youth pastor here at the sanctuary for a while, about 10 years ago. Before he moved to the Pacific Northwest for, for school, now he has a counseling practice in Seattle. Uh, John's a deep thinker. He feels other people's pain. If I ever did anything, if I ever made anything truly good in my life, it was John and his two sisters and his little brother. Well, John had a turtle, uh, a box turtle named Myrtle. Over the ensuing years, we would own actually several of these turtles because these turtles are the very best pet for a busy, a busy dad. Each one is a self-contained, self-sufficient little tank. One of them actually disappeared for two years. That was Homer. And uh, I figured that he had just escaped the pen and he was gone. Two years later, I found Homer in the pen. He had just buried himself in dirt and lived on bugs and snow and rain. Awesome, awesome pets for a busy dad. Myrtle was our first turtle. And at first, she lived in the terrarium in John's bedroom. And we all dreamt of Myrtle experiencing the wild freedom of the great outdoors, a dream that I highly encouraged because Myrtle began to stink. And so one day I said to John, John, let's build a turtle pen. John was just super excited. And I thought, well, this will be a great father-son project. We got the wood, the wire mesh, the crushed granite, what was already there on the side of the house, the tools. John began sharing his dreams of the ultimate turtle pen. And of course, I had to kind of redirect him because I know more about turtles. We began by clearing space on, on the side of the house. Had to move the debris, digging uh, down into the ground, a trench to sink the wire mesh down into because turtles, you know, can dig. I had John move some of the crushed granite from the side of the house but he was, well, he was just awfully slow. And so I remember saying, come on, John, let's hurry up. 
I was working crazy hours at the time, and John really did need to learn the value of hard work. I mean, and what if Myrtle broke free and just was roaming through the neighborhood, you know? Before long, I was huffing and puffing, doing tasks for John, obviously a little exasperated that he wasn't doing them for himself. At the time, and I say this with humility, but I was a much better turtle pin builder than Jonathan. And I too had a dream of the ultimate turtle pin. And, and darn it, if you're going to build a turtle pin, build it right. But the more we built, the more John seemed to kind of shrivel up. It was like he was retreating inside of a shell. I could see it in his eyes. They began to well up with tears. And I knew what he was thinking. I love you, Daddy, but I hate turtle pins. John went inside like a turtle. And I built the turtle pin alone. Later at the gym, trying to figure out what God was saying through 1 Peter chapter 5, I suddenly realized that he was saying something like this. Peter, I didn't ask you to build a turtle pen but I'm building a son and I'd like you to help. If you're going to build a son, build him right. <laughs> so how do you build a son? Or how do you build a person? How do you build a person as opposed to a bunch of turtles in a turtle pen? You know, there are advantages to turtle pens and turtles. Actually, turtles are their own pens. They are their own boxes. And you see, boxes feel safe. And a box surrounded by even more boxes feels even more safe. But box turtles are almost unhuggable. And they bite really hard. So how do you build a person as opposed to a box for a turtle? In that sermon, I remember I also talked about Billy Baldridge, although I struggled to know, knowing exactly what to say. You can barely see Billy's nose down there at the back of the van in that, in that picture. Billy had been like the poster child for Peter Hyatt Ministries, you know, when I was a youth pastor. I mean, he was like the, the kid in, in the youth group that really made me feel like a success about Ten years earlier, along with Billy and the rest of our youth group, I had been building boxes, actually these houses for poor people um, down in Mexico above the above bu bunch of gringo mansions on Rosarito Beach. We were building these houses, and Billy was pounding a nail. And kind of out of the side of my vision, I noticed that he had bent the nail, and he was kind of trying to get the nail to go in straight, and it wouldn't go in straight. It was bent and going sideways, and he was trying to cover this up from me. And so I just turned around and went over to go, hey, bonehead, this is how you do it. And I took the nail and pounded it in, kind of made a joke out of the whole thing, and then we went on building the house. Before I left Bel Air Presbyterian Church, Billy pulled me aside one day, and he said, Peter, I just want to tell you how you changed my life. I remember hoping that he'd quote one of the messages that I had worked so diligently upon or some deep theological insight that I had come up with, but he said it was the nail. I wouldn't have even remembered this except he reminded me. He said it was the nail. I looked confused and he explained, well, Peter, when you turned around, I fully expected you to curse me and ridicule me in front of my friends. I know that sounds crazy, he said, but that's what my dad does. What you did made me believe that maybe there's this thing called love. And God is love. So what were we building in Mexico? A house? or Billy Baldridge, or maybe my ego. You know, if love is a law or some knowledge of good and evil in a book, then you can keep that love in a box, right? Like a toolbox, and then use love as you see fit like a tool for building more boxes. 
But if love is something more like a thing that you bleed when your body is broken, maybe it's not something you can simply control, but the thing that controls you, that animates you. Maybe it's the life that constitutes all life, including your own. Maybe real love is God. For God is love. Well, it was shortly before I, I gave that old message back at Lookout 26 years ago on turtle pens and First Peter that, that I had gotten a call from the father of one of Billy's friends. He said, Billy's dead. Took a walk over at UCLA, she sat down in the quad and pulled a gun out of a brown paper bag and shot himself in the chest and bled out. I don't know what had happened. I suspect that Billy struggled with some mental illness. I know that he was haunted by the accusations from his dad. I don't know why he took his life. But I do know that I hadn't called him for a while when I had thought maybe I should. And I do know that I all of a sudden just felt this incredible shame. Just as I had felt pride, I now felt shame, as if I was the builder of Billy Baldridge and I had failed at building Billy and so building me and now my father, our father in heaven was just terribly disappointed in, in me. And I just wanted to quit. I wanted to crawl inside of my shell. Forget this whole thing. I had used Billy to build my own house, my ego, that is my turtle pen. But I'm pretty sure that I made a joke and straightened the nail, not because I had worked out a plan to glorify me, but because in that moment, at least for a little, in that moment, I actually loved Billy Baldridge. And so my hope is that God is what Billy Baldridge recognized in me. For any real love in me is God in me. It's the, it's the life of Christ in me. You know, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God, which is the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll give account, give a logos for what we've done in the flesh. You cannot inherit the kingdom by taking your own life. So I tell people, suicide won't work. You cannot inherit the kingdom by taking your own life. You can only inherit the kingdom by offering your own life, sacrificing your life. So my hope is that when Billy sees Jesus, whether that was immediately after he pulled the trigger or after he wandered in the darkness for a time, my hope is that he'll recognize Jesus right away, perhaps even from that moment building a house above Rosarito Beach in Mexico. My hope is that he'll recognize our Father, give the life that he has taken, and run into the hands of the one who gave it to him in the very first place. My hope is that Billy recognized Jesus in me. Because for a moment, I recognized Jesus in Billy. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. Whatever the case, I am convinced that one day Jesus will look at both Billy and me and he will say, you are the house I'm building. And we'll both look at Jesus and say, well, thank you for letting us help. I think Jesus will some, say something like that to me and my old friend Bruce McBog, who founded Christ Body Ministries and bled the life of Christ into me, and yet one evening in a depression hung himself from his own balcony. I think Jesus will say something like that to me and my old friend Brian Cross, who came to my office and gave me a hug, for my dad appeared to Brian in a vision of light and told him that I needed one. I told you about Brian a few weeks ago. Several years later, struggling with shame, Brian took his own life. 
It's hard for me to imagine that Jesus and even my dad wouldn't immediately go looking for Brian, who loved the love of God into me with a hug. I think Jesus will say something like that. You are the house that I am building to me and Jim Turner, who preached to all of us about grace, but struggled to believe it for himself. And so one night in despair took his own, own life. I think Jesus will say something like that to Peter and Judas. And Peter and Judas will say, thank you for letting us help. You see, I'm not the only one to lose a disciple to suicide. Jesus understands. And I wonder if Peter felt responsible for Judas. You, you know, Jesus did say to Peter, you are Peter, you are Petros in Greek. It means rock. You are Petros, and on this Petros, on this rock, I will build my church. And Peter knew that the church started with 12 guys, and, and one of them was named Judas. When John sees the Revelation, you know, in the Revelation, he sees the New Jerusalem coming down, and it's built on 12 foundation stones. And there are names on each one of the foundation stones, the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The stones are alive. In fact, the whole city, all the stones are alive because the city is a bride. She's literally a temple constructed with living stones built on these 12 stones. And people will say, well, none of those names on those 12 foundation stones could possibly be Judas because he is the son of perdition. And he is. Or was. Jesus prayed to his father, not one of them has been lost, Apollumi, except the son of perdition, Apollea. That's the noun from the verb Apollumi. So none of the twelve father has been lost except the son of lostness. But Jesus already told us he came to seek and to save the lost. So did he just quit? And Peter just told us that Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. He wrote this, remember, who did not obey in the days of Noah. And this is why the gospel was preached to the dead, that although judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And, and why does this matter? Well, because Jesus is building a house. And until you catch a glimpse of the house that Jesus is building, you'll keep building turtle pens for turtles who find themselves trapped in outer darkness. And one of those turtles will be you. Jesus said, destroy this house, and in three days I will raise it up again. He was speaking of the temple of his body. And for that temple, he had another name, ecclesia. It's often translated church. But we know that he was also speaking of another temple, a giant stone temple that the Jews had been commanded to build and rebuild for a thousand years. That's a long time. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again, and yet hardly anyone believes him, even now. And Peter certainly didn't believe him at first, but I don't think we can even begin to understand Peter now unless we at least take a shot at believing Jesus then and Peter in First Peter. You remember, we read it, and we need to take this not simply metaphorically or poetically, but actually we read this. First Peter 2, 5, you yourselves as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, oikos. And, and now our text for today, First Peter 4, 17, Peter writes, for it is time for judgment to begin at the house, the oikos. Household, or house of God. House of, in the Gospels, that's how everyone referred to the temple, including Jesus. And everyone knew that Judah was God's household. Jesus is the king of the Jews from Judah, which was also a common name, Judas. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house, the oikos of God. And if it begins with us, we are the house, 
What will be the outcome to tell us the end for those who do not obey the gospel, the good news of God? We talked about this last time. There's one end, but the path is a little more painful and difficult for some than for others. But judgment begins at the house. And we know that at one time, Peter felt terribly responsible for this house, for he clearly tried to build this house. He tried to build the house as if it were a giant turtle pen for turtles. Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are Peter, Petros. And on this Petros, on this rock, I will build my church. Then Jesus reveals that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed and be raised. And Peter rebukes him. And of course Peter rebukes him because that's just a stupid way to build anything. Get yourself crucified. But Jesus turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And then to all the disciples, he says, whoever would save his soul, his psyche, his life, will lose it. But whoever would lose his psyche, his soul, his life, for my sake, will find it. Seven days later, Jesus takes Peter up a high mountain, and he's transfigured, shines like the sun, and he casually has a conversation with Elijah and Moses, the resurrected Moses, remember, who had died and sunk into Sheol in the wilderness with all the Israelites that had failed to enter God's rest. I mean, that's huge. Peter's so freaked out by all of this that he blurts out, shall I build three tabernacles? <laughs> Temples containers, boxes for all this glory. See, Peter feels responsible for building the church. A voice booms out of the glory cloud saying something like, this is my beloved son. Stop building turtle pits for turtles. And listen, listen. Short time later, Jesus rides into Jerusalem while thousands sing Hosanna, to the king of kings. And I'm sure Peter's obviously thinking, at last, things are going our way. This is awesome. And then no sooner does that happen, Jesus enters the temple, drives out the money changers, and goes on to say some absolutely terrifying things about his destruction. Before he knows it, Peter is sitting at the Passover feast with Jesus, who mentions betrayal, denial, and all 12 abandoning him. Peter vows to die for Jesus before he would deny Jesus. But in a few hours, having witnessed the betrayal of Judas and Jesus' unwillingness to fight, Peter denies Jesus three times. The cock crows. Jesus looks at Peter while he's being tried, and the look, the look of relentless love that just won't stop, it absolutely undoes Peter, destroys his, his psyche. Judas hangs himself. Peter unravels in grief. Jesus dies and rises, and Jesus finds Peter as he did the very first time fishing on the sea. And you know, Jesus never asked Peter to build the church, did he? He was actually very clear. He said, you are Petros, and on this Petros, or Petru, or Petron, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So on the side of the sea, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And when Peter responds in the affirmative in John 21, Jesus says, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep, probaton. That's a word that refers to sheep and goats. Feed my lambs. It's important to ask yourself, are there any sheep or goats or lambs that do not belong to Jesus to whom the Father has given all things? Jesus says to Peter, tend, poimino is the verb. It means to feed or, or, or shepherd, shepherd my sheep. I 
I love that little video. Because, <laughs> you know, if I was a shepherd named Peter, I'd be mighty tempted to wear a helmet. <laughs> mighty tempted to crawl inside of my own little shell, build a turtle pen for all of the sheep. And Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs. Shepherd my sheep. About 35 years later, Peter writes to the churches in Asia Minor, 1 Peter 5.1, saying, therefore, 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 what's the therefore, therefore? Because it's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. Therefore, I exhort or encourage the elders among you as a fellow Elder, that's quite a thing for supposedly the Pope to say, a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings, the passion of Christ, as well as a partaker, a communicant in the glory that is being about to be revealed. Shepherd, poimino, feed ten shepherds, shepherds. You see, it's the same word that Jesus used on the side of the sea 35 years earlier. Not build my church, shepherd, feed the sheep. Shepherd the sheep, the flock, poimnion, the herd, that can be sheep or goats or cows, or whatever, the flock of God that is among you. And then some ancient manuscripts add this, exercising oversight, episcopeo in Greek. It's where we get the word bishop and the word episcopalian. The word translated elder is a Greek word presbuteros, which is where we get the word presbyterian, you see, we've all built elaborate turtle pens around both of those words, right? But episcopeo is what every shepherd does for a sheep. He just watches over the sheep. And every one of you is a presbuteros to someone. In other words, every one of you is an elder to someone that's a little bit younger, that's not quite as far along on this journey or path that's called life. So he's talking to you right now, saying, shepherd the folks around you. Number one, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Number two, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Number three, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples, imprints, types, to the flock. Number one, if you lead people under compulsion, it means that something is constraining you from the outside. Right? Like you're in a pin. You do it not because you want to do it, but because you have to do it. And you're afraid of what will happen if you don't do it. So you're not free. Which means it's not love. It's fear. Number two, if you leave people for shameful gain, it also means that you don't do it because you want to do it, but you're compelled to do it for some other reason, you know, like shameful gain. So, so you're using people for some other reason, like building your own ego. And so you're not free. It's not love. It may not be fear per se. Well, probably is, but, but it's at least greed. Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, you must remember to love people and use things rather than love things and use people. Use people, you know, like to build your box, your, your turtle pen, your, your ego, for instance. Number three, not domineering, literally not lording it over those in your charge, and isn't that why Peter got so frustrated with Jesus, right? Peter knew he was the Lord and he wouldn't lord over anyone. Ugh. And isn't that why we picture Jesus as being a different kind of Lord the second time when he comes around? Because he just didn't lord over folks the first time. That's what went wrong. If it's all about building turtle pins, like the United States of America or the Episcopalian Church, or the Presbyterian Church. If it's all about building turtle pins, then it's all about legislation and execution, enforcing that legislation. It's all about lording it over people. But Jesus just seems to have very little interest in building turtle pins, or even protecting turtles, for that matter. Because like I said, turtles are almost impossible to hug. And they do bite hard. 
If Jesus was all about building turtle pens to protect turtles, I think he would have just issued a bunch of threats and promises. That's what the law and execution is all about, threats and promises, promises to keep us safe from all sources of pain, like Billy Baldridge and Bruce McBog and, and Brian Cross and Jim Turner and Judas Iscariot and little boys that would rather watch TV than haul rock. <laughs> Number three, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Examples of what? Or examples of whom? In the country church of a small village, quite some time, a boy, uh, time ago, an altar boy was serving the priest at Sunday Mass, and he accidentally dropped the pitcher of wine. That's the blood of Christ. The village priest struck the altar boy sharply right across the face, and in a gruff, angry voice, he said, leave the altar and don't ever come back. And he never did. That boy became Tito the atheist communist leader of Yugoslavia, you know, the former Yugoslavia. About the same time, in a cathedral of a large city, an altar boy serving the bishop at Sunday Mass accidentally dropped a pitcher of wine, the blood of Christ, and with a warm twinkle in his eye, the, the bishop gently whispered to the boy, someday, you're going to be a priest. And he was. That was the Archbishop Fulton Sheen. One sacrificed the boy for the turtle pen, and the other sacrificed the turtle pen for the boy. And with a word, he fed a lamb and ushered in the kingdom. Archbishop Fulton Sheen was kind of like the Billy Graham of Roman Catholicism 50 years ago. I did a little sloppy research this week, you know, with Google and Wikipedia, and then I lost all my the footnotes to where I found this. But um, in 350 A.D., just after Christianity was legalized with the Edict of Milan, or, the, or it was allowed with the Edict of Milan, and just before it became the official religion of the Roman Empire when it was enforced on people, in 350 AD, it's estimated that as much as 56.5% of the population of the empire claimed to be followers of Christ. Which means that about 25% of the world, the world population would have claimed to be followers of Christ. Which means that as a proportion of the world's population, the church hasn't grown hardly at all since then. But before 350 AD, when it was illegal to confess Christ as Lord, the church grew at an absolutely astounding pace. It grew at that pace when it was illegal to build turtle pens for Jesus. Isn't that wild? If you know church history, you know that the same story played out in the 20th century in sub-Saharan Africa and in China. China, which contains the second highest or perhaps the highest population of committed Christians in the world. China, where most turtle pens for Jesus are illegal. And the atheistic state, like the old Roman Empire, holds all the power. Sociologists define power as the ability to force others to yield to your own will even against their own will, power. But they define authority as the ability to persuade others to surrender their will to your will because your will has freely become their own will. And sociologists also note that as power increases, authority decreases. And as authority increases, Power, or the need to use power, also decreases, like in a democracy where the citizens trust the integrity of their leaders. Or in a marriage where each one sacrifices for the other. Or in a family where a father sacrifices for all and everyone knows it. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself, said Jesus. And he said this to show by what manner of death he would die, writes John. Power is seized, often with bloodshed. Authority is earned with blood that is shed for those who are loved. Authority, I think I would call that the power of romance power of love. 
First Peter 5, 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Literally, be clothed, be clothed, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, literally, be humble. You really can't humble yourself or you'll be proud of your humility, right? But if you're exposed to the grace of God the way like David was exposed to the grace of God or Paul was exposed to the grace of God or Peter was exposed to the grace of God, well, you'll be humbled and then set free. Be humbled, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that the proper time he may exalt you. You see, there's this there's like this beautiful harmony to all of Scripture and a, and a wonderful simplicity to the gospel once you believe the Bible. And you let go of the unbiblical notion that God has to endlessly torture members of parts of his family or his own creation. The humble will be exalted and the exalted will be humbled. Maybe he meant that. The first will be last, and the last will be first. If he actually meant that, and you actually believe that, well then as soon as you perceived yourself to be first, well you would rejoice in becoming last. And as soon as you were last, you'd rejoice in being exalted to first, only to become last, and first, and last, and first, and last, and first, as if you were in a great dance and constantly deferring to your partner until all distinctions between first and last and last and first were dissolved in this beautiful symphony of eternal joy. Why? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. It doesn't say anything about him stopping. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all, said Jesus to Peter, which obviously means that if any are lost in hell and you consign them to hell with your unforgiveness, Jesus is slave to them there in hell. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. According to John, he's the rhythm, the logos of the song. And according to Jesus, once humbled in you, he will be exalted in you, and we will all start dancing. And being found in him in human form, he humbled himself, wrote Paul. That's the point of crucifixion. It strips you of your ego revealing whatever lies beneath. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. See, I think we're all predestined to dance with Jesus who refused to leave any of us alone because it's not good that the Adam is alone, said God. Unless the seed dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit, said Jesus. The first Adam became a living soul, psyche, writes Paul. And you know the story. God breathed his, his breath, right, his spirit, like, like a seed, into the Adam of the dust, and Adam became a living psyche. It breathed his spirit like an imperishable seed into an earthen vessel, and, and yet the Adam was alone. The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. He's the word of God, literally the sperma of God. On the cross, he cried, it is finished, and into your hands I commit my spirit. First Peter 1, 23, you remember we preached on all this. We read this. You all have been begotten again, not of perishable spora, but imperishable spora. That's seed in the feminine, like seed of the feminine gender, like, like an egg. You all have been begotten again, not of perishable spora, but imperishable spora through the living and abiding word of God. That's the sperma of God. Then Peter tells us this word is the good news that was preached to you. So you get the picture? The church fathers referred to this as the recapitulation of Adam. That means humanity. The recapitulation of Adam. It's how they described the atonement. It is the idea that the imperishable eternal breath of God is hidden 
in the soil of every person. The spora of God. But it's enlivened through the sperma of God, the word of God. And so we are born of God at the cross, shedding the womb of our self-centered flesh and then being drawn together by love as we begin to live the life of God as the very body of Christ, which is God's temple, his church, descending from heaven to earth, the new Jerusalem coming down. Or to put it the other way around, when the spirit in me recognizes the spirit in Billy Baldridge, and the spirit in Billy Baldridge recognizes the spirit in me, when we love each other, the body of Christ begins rising from the dead. It dances out of a tomb that is our lonely old selves. And so, of course, I, Peter Hyatt, cannot build the church. I am the church. I cannot build the church, but I can speak the word of love and feed the flock of God, which is the house of God, hidden in a bunch of dirty earthen vessels. And it was at this point in the sermon 26 years ago that I introduced our new building program. And then I said this. If we come together in love, building a beautiful building on the side of I-70, and it subsequently burns to the ground, we will still have built the church, or better, be the church that God has built. But if we build a building that stands for 200 years, and yet build it with intimidation, manipulation, and power, that is compulsion for shameful gain by lording it over others, we will only have built a lonely turtle pen full of lonely turtles. <laughs> we built the building. And we needed the building. It was a great building. And we grew even more. I think we doubled like right away until someone said something like this. Hey, wait a minute. It sounds like you're saying that you think it's possible that Jesus might even descend to the spirits in prison so that judge in the flesh the way men are. They might live in the spirit the way God does. And I said, yep. They informed our denomination. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church began to investigate. They said, you can't say that. I said, why can't I say that? I'm just quoting Bible verses. They said, well, yeah, but you're not quoting them the way that sounds like us. And by that meant you, meant you're not quoting them and then explaining them away. I was genuinely confused as to why they seem so incredibly offended. I don't know, but I often wonder if it's because it's much easier to lead with compulsion for shameful gain and lording it over others if you can threaten others with endless conscious torment and entice them with the ability to judge who's in and who's out. It's easier to do that than to trust the romance of God and the power, the power of imperishable seed. They put a committee together put me on trial, and then offered me a choice. I could make a public statement confessing that there was a group of people that God did not want to save, a group of people that God was unable to save, or I could, and I would, lose my ordination. And because there were a few in power that didn't want to give the church the opportunity to, to vote and leave the denomination, I knew that I'd also lose my church, or at least the institution the wood and the wire mesh, the stones. People still wonder why I did that. Because they ask me, actually quite often. And you see, it's really quite simple. I didn't want to renounce the seed that I'd been planting for 15 years. You cannot testify to God is salvation by preaching that God is not salvation, for we actually need to save ourselves from God with our knowledge of good and evil and our own judgment. 
I didn't want to renounce the seed. God is salvation. Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus is the imperishable seed. I didn't want to renounce the seed for a turtle pen full of lonely turtles, and I knew that I would be one of those lonely turtles if I did. And that's why what I did wasn't brave, like at all. I just didn't want to become a lonely old turtle. And it wasn't brave for one other reason. It's the next verse. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had an adversary who was prowling around just waiting for someone to devour. So, if it comes to a choice between the turtle pen and the seed, always forfeit the turtle pen and plant the seed because it's imperishable. We sold our house in Golden years ago and I'm sure the turtle pen's long gone, but the seed I planted in my son and the seed he planted in me was still growing. If I had it to do over again, I'd do it differently, but the seed is eternal and it makes all things new. So if you plant it even 40 years later, it makes things new. You can plant it by just saying, John, I'm sorry for being a butthead when we were building the turtle pen. If it comes to a choice between the turtle pen and the seed, always plant the seed. And whether you know it or not, I bet you plant the seed all the time. I mean, have you ever seen someone struggling with a nail? just trying to get it in, and it bends, and, and, and then you want to help that someone because you see yourself in that someone. Not because you're trying to use that someone or manipulate that someone or dominate that someone, and, and so you do help that someone just because you love that someone. Well, then you planted the seed. On that day, the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. He will say to those on his right, I was sick. Imagine that. Jesus was sick. He'll say, I was sick. I was sick and you visited me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was pounding a nail and bent it and you straightened it. You made a joke out of it and planted a seed. And, and oh yeah, I was an insecure youth pastor who needed encouragement. <laughs> you spoke the word. And you'll say, When? And he'll say, when you did it to one of the least of these. Now, you may also discover that there's another part of yourself that never even noticed the least of these because that part of yourself was preoccupied with yourself, the turtle pen that is your ego. But don't worry. The one on the throne is always ready to judge you and cut that ego away from you and set you free to love and be loved and plant the seed and be the seed. Sometimes people will say to me, Peter, I love the word that you preach, but I don't know what to do and what to say. And, and I always want to say, well, yes, you do. You do. Just believe God's word of relentless love for you. Soak in God's word of relentless love for you. Worship God and his word, his relentless love for you, the one seated on the throne, and then do what you want to do. We love because he first loved us. And love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love does everything. I'm so grateful for you, the sanctuary. You know, almost by accident, we have this really nice building. It's actually the cheapest way that we can meet as a group and do the thing that we do online. We have this beautiful building, but I know that you're not here because of our sexy turtle pen. but because of imperishable seed. Do you realize that when Jesus was crucified on the tree, his church had shrunk from hundreds of thousands <sighs> down to his mom. And probably a, an old hooker, don't know that for sure, but named Mary. All of his disciples had fled. Even if John returned for a time to watch him die, there were no more signs and wonders. He had written no books. He had authored no policy manuals. He had no organization. He had no building, only prophesied the destruction of the building, the temple, 
the city, the box. And now all he could do was speak a word like a seed. Father, forgive. It is finished. And into your hands I commit my spirit. The night before, he had taken bread, applied hand sanitizer, and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, and after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is the judgment. This is the salvation. This is the creation. This is the imperishable seed. Always trust the power of the imperishable seed. Trust the shepherd who feeds you with himself. Amen.